الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ومن أحسن قولا ممن ضائل الله وعمل صالحا وقال إنني من المسلمين رب الشريف صدري ويسلي أمري وحل الأقدة من لساني أفضل قولي I welcome all the viewers with the Islamic greetings Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh May peace, mercy and blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be on all of you and I welcome all of you to the second part of this program Ask Dr. Zakir and his son Farik Season 2, Session 2 I would like to thank Farik for answering the first two questions and inshallah from here I'll be answering the questions just to remind you you are most welcome to ask your question in brief on any of the social media platforms but the best would be to text your message on the WhatsApp in brief along with your name, your profession, your city and country of residence to the WhatsApp number plus six zero double one two six nine five three eight nine five. I repeat plus six zero double one two six nine five three eight nine five. You are most welcome to ask any questions on Islam and comparative religion or question that any non-Muslim or any atheist may have asked you regarding Islam and you are unable to reply or any question or query that you find on the media if you require any answers dealing with Islam, reason, logic and science this is your opportunity. The first question is from Arif Qazi from London, UK. The month of Dhul Hijjah is after four to five days. What is the importance of the first ten days of Dhul Hijjah? And that's a very important question. I would like to thank Brother Arif for asking this question because according to me, the importance of the first ten Dhul Hijjah are the forgotten Sunnah of the beloved Prophet. Unfortunately, most of the Muslims throughout the world have forgotten the importance of the first ten days of the Nijjah. Most of us Muslims very well know about Ramadan and we prepare for the month of Ramadan and we know most of its advantage, most of the blessings of Ramadan. But unfortunately, very few of us Muslims are aware of the first ten days of the Nijjah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes an oath in the glorious Quran in Surah Fajr, chapter number 9, verse number 1 and 2, where Allah says, Wal Fajr, Wal Ash, by Fajr, by dawn, and by the ten nights. Here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is taking the oath of Fajr and by ten nights. Here the Mufassirin say, when Allah is taking the oath, Wal Ash, that is by the ten nights. It is referring to the first ten days of the Rijjah. Now people will wonder why does Allah use the word nights when he is referring to the days of the first ten days of the Rijjah. This is common in many languages. If I have to say in English that I was ten days in New York, I spent ten days in New York. But naturally when I say I spent ten days in New York, it means I spent 10 days and 10 nights in New York. It's understood. When I say days, many a times the nights are included. Similarly, in Arabic, when days are mentioned, the nights are included. And when nights are mentioned, many a times even the days are included. It can only mean night. It can mean day and night also. It can mean only day, depending upon the context. So when Allah says here, He's taking the oath of 10 nights, the Mufassirin, they say, it refers to the first 10 days of the Nijjah. And if you read Tafsir ibn Khasir, it says that the first 10 days of the Nijjah are the most important days in the complete year. There are no days besides these 10 days which are more important. These 10 days in the full year are the most important days of the year, even more important 
than the last 10 days of Ramadan. But the last 10 nights of Ramadan are more important than the first 10 nights of the Lijjah. Because in the last 10 nights of Ramadan is the Laylatul Qadr. Because Laylatul Qadr falls in the last 10 nights of Ramadan, the last 10 nights of Ramadan are the most important 10 nights in the full year and the first 10 days of the Lijjah are the most important days in the full year. It's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, volume 2, hadith number 969. The Prophet said, that There are no deeds better than the deeds done on the first 10 days of the Lijjah. There are no deeds done on any other day better than the deeds done on the first 10 days of the Lijjah. So the Sahaba asked, Prophet. What about jihad? The Prophet said, even jihad, the deeds done on the first 10 days of the Lijjah are better even than jihad. Except if jihad is done with the wealth and the life of the person and the person returns back without any of the two. That means if a person goes for jihad with his wealth and his life and he is martyred, that is the only deed one deed which is better than the good deeds done in the first 10 days of the Lijjah. A similar message is repeated in al Darimi, Hadith number 1925. It's narrated by Ibn Abbas that the Prophet peace be upon him said, the deeds done in the first 10 days of the Lijjah are the best deeds. There is no other deeds done on any other day which is better than the deeds done in the first 10 days of the Rijjah. And when someone asked the Prophet, what about Jihad? The Prophet said, even Jihad. Unless the person goes for Jihad with his wealth and life and comes back without both of them. That means unless a person is martyred in the battlefield while doing Jihad, that is the only deed which is better than the good deeds done in the first 10 days of the Lijjah. That means the first 10 days of the Lijjah are the most important 10 days in the full year. There is no doubt about it. And unfortunately, most of us Muslims are unaware of this fact. It's mentioned in Sai Muslim, volume 3, hadith number 2747, when the beloved Prophet Musa was asked about the fasting on the day of Arafah. The beloved Prophet Musa said that fasting on the day of Arafah expiates the sins of the previous year and the coming year. The most important fast after the first fast of Ramadan is the fasting on the day of Arafah. It's the most important. There are some scholars, very few, who say fasting of Muharram, the fasting of Ashura, is the most important after the first fast of Ramadan because the hadith of the Prophet which says that fasting in Muharram and Ashura is the most important fast after the fast of Ramadan. But in this fast, the Prophet said, the sins of the previous year is expiated, is forgiven. But if you fast during the day of Arafah, then the sins of the previous year and the next year, the following year, two years are forgiven. That is the reason most of the scholars say that the most important fast after the fasting of the further fast of Ramadan is the fasting of Arafah. But it is unanimous that these two fasts, the fasting of Arafah and the fasting of Ashura, are the two most important fasts after the first fast of Ramadan. It further mentioned in Sunan Abu Dawud, word number three, hadith number 2437, that the wives of the Prophet said, the Prophet fasted during the first nine days of the Lijjah. And he fasted during Ashura and 
three days every month. The first Monday and two Thursday. We come to know from this hadith that the Prophet fasted all the nine days, the first nine days of the Lijjah. That means besides the ninth of the Lijjah, the day of Arafah, it is mustahab, it is sunnah to fast all the first nine days of the Lijjah. If someone says I cannot, then at least fast besides Arafah, Monday and Thursday. But the best is fasting all the first nine days of the Lijjah because these are the best days of the year. One may ask, why not fast the ten days? Why only first nine days? The reason is our beloved Prophet Muhammad said. Let's mention Sahih Bukhari, number three, Hadith number 1991, that the Prophet said it is prohibited to fast on Eid al Fitr and Eid al Adha. Both the Eid day, Eid al Fitr, the Eid after Ramadan, and Eid al Adha, that is the tenth of the Lajja. These two days are the days of Eid. So the Prophet said it is prohibited to fast on the two days of Eid. That is the reason it is most up to fast on the first nine days of the Lajja. It is further mentioned in Sahih Muslim that the Prophet said you should not fast on the Ayyam al Tashri. That means the three days following the Eid al Adha. Because these are the days of eating and drinking. And the Prophet also said, it's mentioned in Sahih Muslim, that if you are slaughtering an animal, then that person should not cut his nail or cut his hair from the first day of the Lija till he slaughters the animal. If you are doing Qurbani, if you are slaughtering, then it is mustahab. It is sunnah that you should not cut your nails or cut your hair from the first day of the Lija till the time you slaughter the animal. But if someone is slaughtering on behalf of someone else, then that person need not follow this rule. Means if I am not slaughtering and if somebody is slaughtering on my behalf, then I need not follow this rule. If I am slaughtering myself, then this rule has to be followed. It is further mentioned in Futul Bari that the Prophet recommended that during these first 10 days of the Rija, you should say the Takbir. And it's mentioned for the body that the takbir is Allah Akbar, Allah Akbar, La ilaha illallah, Allah Akbar, wa lillahi alhamd. This is the takbir, it is recommended. All the 10 days should decide. A similar message is repeated in Mustan Ahmad, hadith number 5446, where the Prophet said that according to Ibn Umar, Abdullah ibn Umar, May Allah be pleased with him. He said that the Prophet said, There are no deeds better than the deeds done on the first ten days of the Lijjah. Therefore, say the Tahleel, La ilaha illallah. Say the Takbir, Allah Akbar. Say the Tahmeed, Alhamdulillah. Same thing. Allah Akbar, Allah Akbar, La ilaha illallah, Allah Akbar, wa lillahi alhamd. So it is recommended that all these ten days you say the Takbir, the Tahleel, the Tahmeed. It's further mentioned in Sayyid Bukhari, volume number 2, page number 65, that Abdullah ibn Umar, he said, and Abu Harairah, may Allah be pleased with them both, that Abdullah ibn Umar and Abu Harairah, they used to go out in the marketplace during the first 10 days of the Rijjah and loudly say the Takbirat. And when the other Sahaba is to hear, then they should repeat it by themselves. Now, do we see any Muslims in the marketplace, in the mall, in the soup, saying the Takbir loudly during the first 10 days? Maybe in some countries, maybe some of the Gulf countries, but normally in India, Pakistan, in Malaysia, Indonesia, we don't find Muslims going out to the marketplace and saying loudly Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar La ilaha illallah, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar So no, you don't find it. So inshallah most of the viewers I would like to tell you that the first 10 days of Dhul Rijjah inshallah will be after 4 or 5 days in Malaysia, in Saudi in the Gulf countries, inshallah it will be 
from the 22nd of July from Wednesday, four days from today. Other countries, it will be up to five days, maybe India, Pakistan, and Bangladesh, and some countries maybe one day later. See to it that we follow these sunnah and revive the sunnah and do not let the first 10 days go in waste. This topic of the first 10 days will actually require a big talk for a few hours. Time is limited. I will just mention the important good deeds that a person should do during these first 10 days of the Lijah. I will not mention all, I will mention the important 35 ones. Number one is that you should pray your all five times daily for the Salah in Jamaat in the mosque. Number two, if you have not done Hajj and if Hajj is farad on you, if you have the means and the wealth and the health and you are an adult, then doing Hajj is farad. Even if you have done it, if you don't do it again, it is musta, it is good, you can do it. But unfortunately, now we are going through the pandemic. The coronavirus, COVID-19, that is the reason the foreigners, those who are outside Saudi, but the Saudis and the foreigners in Saudi, they can do, but only a limited few, only a few thousand, I think, will be permitted this Hajj. Inshallah, we'll hope that Allah gives us the chance next year, Inshallah, to do Hajj. Number three, that do not do any haram during this first 10 days of the Nijjah. You should not do haram throughout your life, but be particular, not only the major sins, avoid totally even the minor sins during these 10 days. You have to not do sins throughout your life, but be more particular during the first 10 days of Dhulija that even by mistake do not do any sin. Leave aside the major sin, do not even do the minor sins. The fourth point is, fast during Yomul Arafa, the ninth Dhulija, the day of Arafa. Inshallah, your previous year's sins and the next year's sin will be forgiven, inshallah. Expiated would be forgiven, inshallah. But natural, when the hadith says your sins will be forgiven, it's understood the minor sins, not the major sins. Point number five. It's preferable you fast the first nine days of Dhul all the first nine days. If you cannot for any particular reason, at least fast on Arafah and Monday and Thursday. But preferable you fast all the nine days the first nine days of the Lija. The sixth point is that slaughter an animal if you have the capacity on Yom Nahar. That is on Eid al Adha or the three days following on Ayyam al Tashri. Seventh is say the Tasbih, Subhanallah, say the Tahleel, La ilaha illallah, say the Takbirat, that Allah Akbar, say the Tahmeed, Alhamdulillah. Or as I said earlier, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, La ilaha illallah, Allahu Akbar, walillahi alhamd. As many times as you can during all these 10 days. The more you say, the better it will be and you'll be rewarded a lot for this. Eighth is, pray your tahajjud during the last one third of the night and recite long verses of the Quran. The longer you do, the better. At least read eight rakat tahajjud followed by the witr three rakat and for long hours during the last one third of night. Pray your sunnat e -Mokada. There are 12 sunnat e -Mokada in the full day. Two raka sunnah before the Fajr Salah, two plus two, four raka sunnah before the Dohar Salah, two raka sunnah after the Dohar Salah, two raka sunnah after the Maghrib Salah, and two raka sunnah after the Isha Salah. So totally there are 12 Sunnat al and the Prophet said that anyone who reads these 12 Sunnat al regularly, inshallah, he will go to Jannah and get a house close to the Prophet. Pray your Salat al Doha, preferably four rakat, you can even pay two rakat, after sunrise, anytime after 20 minutes, till before 20 minutes of the sun reaching its highest point. See to it that you do maximum charity during these 10 days. Besides your further zakat, do as much of charity as you can. Do dua before iftar. And since we'll be fasting, so dua before iftar is accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Do 
as much as du'a as you can during all these 10 days. Do as much of dhikr as you can during these 10 days. Read as much of the Quran as you can during these 10 days. Do tilawat of Quran. If you can, you do memorization of the Quran. Read the Quran. If you don't know Arabic as a language, read along with the Arabic portion. Read the translation in the language you understand the best. Read the tafsir of the Quran. If you can, teach Quran to others. The eleventh point is that ask Allah for forgiveness. As much as you can do istighfar, do during these first ten days of the Lijjah. Do as much, recite as much as of the dua of the Prophet Muhammad All the dua which are recommended. And the best book to refer is the Fortress of the Muslim, that history of Muslim where the authentic duas are mentioned. Do as many other good deeds as you can in these 10 days of the Lijjah, as much as you can. Whatever small deed, medium deed, big good deed, do as much as you can. Follow as much as of the Sunnah of the Prophet as you can during these first 10 days. For example, when you wear the footwear, wear with your right foot. When you remove the footwear, remove with your left foot. When you enter the mosque, enter with the right foot. When you step out of the mosque, step out from the left foot. When you're wearing the clothes, put your right hand first. When you're removing the clothes, remove it with the left side first. These are the sunnahs. When you're drinking water, sit down and drink water. As much as of the sunnah you can do, it is better during the first 10 days of the Lijjah. Then do taskiyah nafs, purification of the soul. This is the 15th point, purification of the soul. The 16th point is that read as much as say hadith you can of the Prophet. Forgive people's fault as much as you can. Avoid all the makru. As much as the makru discourage acts you can avoid, please avoid and don't do it. Do isla with the other Muslims as much as you can. Do dawah with the non-Muslims. Invite them to the fold of Islam. Invite them towards Tawheed. Read the Sunnah Agir Mawkidah. The Sunnah Agir Mawkidah are 10 in the full day. Two rakat Sunnah after the Dohar Salah. After the two rakat of Sunnah the Mawkidah, you can read two rakat Sunnah Agir Mawkidah after the Dohar Salah. Then two plus two, four rakat before the Asar Salah. Two rakat before the Maghrib Salah and two rakat before the Isha Salah. Totally there are ten Sunnah Tegir Mokadah. Attend as many live lectures as you can of scholars, the durus, the lectures, the question and answer session of the authentic scholars. If you cannot attend personally, then watch them on the videos, on the social media, on the YouTube, on the Facebook. You can hear them on the audio, on the audio tape, on the DVDs on the social media. You can read books of the seerah of the Prophet. You can read books of the authentic scholars. Give as much time as you can for your family members. Because the Prophet said, the best Muslim is he who is best to his family, especially his wife. Do not waste a single minute during these first 10 days of Lujah because these 10 days are the most important days of the year. You cannot afford to waste a single minute be kind and nice to people. Be good to the neighbors. Be happy and cheerful and be nice and courteous to all the people living around you. This was in brief about the 35 important points that should be done during the first 10 days of the Lija. There are many more you can add, but since time is limited, these are the important points I mentioned and inshallah for more details you can refer to my Facebook and to my other lectures on this topic and I hope I have done justice in brief to the importance of the first 10 days of the Lija. The next question is from Muhammad Sheikh Chicago, USA. What are the virtues of Arafah? Due to limited time, I did not cover the more details of Arafah except one important detail. But the next question is asking me to mention the virtues of Arafah. So Alhamdulillah, Allah has given me more time 
to spend on this topic. Again, the virtues of Arafat, you can spend hours together discussing it. I will just mention seven important points of the virtues of Arafat. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Buruj, chapter number 85, verse number 3, وَشَاهِدُوا وَمَشُودُ By the witnessing day and by the witness day. Here Allah is taking oath of the witnessing day referring to Friday and the witness day referring to Yom Al-Arafah. And if you read the hadith in Jami Tirmidhi, volume number 6, hadith number 3339, the beloved Prophet Muhammad said that when Allah speaks about the Yom al Mashud, the witness day, Allah is referring to Yom al Arafah. And when Allah is referring to a Shaheed, the witnessing day, Allah is referring to Friday. So, according to this hadith in Jami Tirmidhi, we realize that when Allah says in Surah Buruj, chapter number 85, Allah is taking oath in verse number 3, by the witnessing day referring to Friday and by the witnessed day Allah is referring to Yom Al-Arafah. Allah is taking oath of Yom Al-Arafah. Further is mentioned in the hadith of Muslim Ahmad, hadith number 2455 that the Prophet said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brings out the children of Adam from their loins on the day of Arafah and he asked them the question that who is your Lord? And then the same thing is mentioned. Allah says in Surah Araf, chapter number 7, verse number 172 and 173, that Allah brings out from the loin of Adam, the children of Adam, and asks them that who is your Lord? Who is your Rabb? And all the children of Adam, they bear witness that Allah is the Rabb. And Allah says, so that on the day of judgment, you will not say that I did not know who is my Lord. Or you will not say that my parents, they used to do idol worship. So this excuse will not be accepted. Here it's mentioned in the Hadith of Musa Ahmad, also as in the Quran, in Surah Araf, chapter 7, verse 172 and 173, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brings out from the law and the children of Adam and asks them and they bear witness that Allah is their Rabb, Allah is their Lord. It's further mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, point number one, hadith number 45, that once a Jew approaches Hazrat Umar an, the second caliph of Islam, and says, O chief of the believers, if what was revealed in your scripture was revealed in our scriptures, we would have celebrated it as an Eid, a day of festival. So Umar an asked the Jew, which verse are you referring to? So then the Jew quotes Surah Maida chapter 5 verse number 3 On this day have I perfected your religion for you and I have chosen for you Islam and I have completed my favor on you Hazrat Umar he says this day we know it was revealed to the Prophet on a Friday on Yom Al Arafah that means this day the day this verse was revealed Surah Maida chapter 5 verse number 3 and most of the Mufassirin say this is the last verse of the Quran that was revealed. It was revealed to the Prophet on Yom Al Arafah. And it says that this day have I perfected religion for you and have chosen for you Islam and complete my favor on you. It is further mentioned in Sunan Abu Dawud, point number three, Hadith number 2419, that the Prophet said, Yomul Arafah, Yomul Nahar, and Ayyamul Tashriq. That means the ninth day of Dil Hajj, Yomul Arafah, and Yomul Nahar, the Idul Adha. And the three days following Ayyamul Tashriq are the days of festival, are the days of Eid, the days of eating and drinking. Those people who are doing Hajj, for them, on the Yomul Arafah, Yomul Arafah is Hajj, according to the Prophet. And it is like Eid. It is the day of feasting and drinking and eating. And people who are doing Hajj, they should not fast on Yom Al-Arafah. The fasting which I mentioned in my early answer is only for those who are not doing Hajj. But those who are doing Hajj, it is not recommended for them to fast. It is the day of Eid. 
day of eating and drinking. It is further mentioned in Sunan An Nasai, Hadith number 3006, that the Prophet said that there is no day in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala frees his slaves, male and female, more than the day of Arafah. That means on this day, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala frees the maximum of the people from hellfire, male and female. And this day is the best day of forgiveness. And Yom al Arafah is the best day of the year, without doubt. Like the best night of the year is Lail al Qadr, the best day of the year is Yom al Arafah. Allah frees the maximum of slaves from the hellfire, male and female. It's the best day of forgiveness. It's further mentioned in Jam Tirmidhi, hadith number 3585, where the Prophet said that Yom al Arafah is the best day and the best dua to be done on this day is La ilaha illallah wa'adahu la sharika lo lal mulku lal hamdu la kulli shayin kadeem that there is no more but Allah he has got no partners to him belongs everything all praises are due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah has power over all things this dua according to the Prophet is the best dua and during Yom al Arafah doing this dua as much as you can it is recommended you can do during all these 10 days but during Yom al Arafah specifically this dua the Prophet recommended and said that if you do the dua it's the best dua and the seventh virtue the last which I mentioned in my early answer also that it is mentioned in say Muslim Volume number three, hadith number 2747, that the beloved Prophet Muhammad said that fasting on the day of Arafah expiates your sins of the previous year and the next year. Your previous year and the next year sins are forgiven if you fast on Yom al Arafah. So, inshallah, the 10 days of Dhulajah will be starting very soon after four or five days. And Yom al Arafah, inshallah, will come after about two weeks. And we see to it that we do as much as the Sunnah, and we revive the Sunnah, and we do the good deeds in the 10 days of the Lajjah, as well as specifically on Yom al Arafah. Hope that's the question. We have on the Facebook Abu Dhar Khan, Umme Kulsum Nipa, Muhammad Anas, El Haru Haruna, Mizbah Yusuf. Muzaffar Hussein Rahat, Muhammad Dinar. Oh, yeah, we have Amina Shri, Sabuna Oromo, that's on the Facebook. Munira Tabassum, Meza bin Nayan, Zawadul Qadir, Abdullah Rizbi, Muhammad Riyal Hussein, Jamal Gul, Muhammad Islam Maruf, Terikul Islam Sezan. Baba Jumandi Kamara, most of them are saying Assalamu Alaikum, Wa Alaikum Salaam, they are saying lots of love, lots of love to you also. They are doing duas and I do duas for you too. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant you Jannah and Jannah the inshallah. On the YouTube, we have Muhammad Azizul Haq, Asana Mimi, Sohan Sarkar, Imon Hassan, Muhammad Azizul Haq, Mustarino, Nevendanu Paul, Yaya Pathan, Kanis Fatima, Bhakt Hunter, Muhammad Azharuddin, Muhammad Rashid, Muhammad Azizul Haq. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward all of you, inshallah. The next question is from Jabir Haruna from Nigeria. I am a police officer. Is it allowed for a public officer to accept gratification and gifts from public which one does not demand for? Another question from Anonymous India but living in Dubai. 
if anyone accepts bribe for some years and he then repents and makes toba, how can he refund or compensate as he has collected money from too many people by doing fraud? Brother Jabir has asked a question that if he gets gratification or without demanding some gifts as a police officer, then is it accepted or not? Our beloved Prophet said, it's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, volume number 9, hadith number 6979, that the Prophet told one of the persons to go and collect zakat. So when he comes back, he tells the Prophet, this is your money of zakat and this is the gift I received. The Prophet replies that will you go and sit at the home of your father and the home of your mother and do you think you'll get these gifts? And the Prophet gets very angry and immediately when he's addressing the people, he tells, Oh my people, I had appointed one of you to do an important task for me which Allah had entrusted on me, referring to collection of zakat. That person comes and gives me and says, this is the zakat money which is for you and this is the gift I received. I told him that will you go and sit at the house of your father and the house of your mother and do you think you'll get these gifts? Then the Prophet says that, O oh people, you do not take a single unlawful thing. Otherwise, you will carry that with you on the day of judgment. The Prophet said, do not take any single thing unlawful. Otherwise, you will carry that thing with you on the day of judgment to Allah. And the Prophet said, I do not want any of you to be seen carrying a camel which is grunting or a cow which is mooing or a sheep which is bleating. That means the Prophet has prohibited anyone from taking anything extra and unlawful. It's further mentioned in the hadith of Sunan Abu Dawud, volume number 3, hadith number 2943, that the Prophet said that the person who we employ for administrative work and when we give him provision, if he takes anything besides that, it is gulul, meaning embezzlement, meaning fraud, meaning bribery. It's further mentioned in the hadith of Sunan Abu Dawud, volume number 3, hadith number 2945, that the Prophet said that if we employ anyone for administrative work, and if he comes with his wife, if he doesn't have a servant, he may have a servant. If he doesn't have a dwelling, he may have a dwelling. And Abu Bakr, he continues, that the Prophet said that anything above this is treachery and theft. It's further mentioned in Musnad Ahmad, hadith number 23601, that the beloved Prophet said that anything received by employee of the government, it is hulul, embezzlement, it is treachery. From all these hadith we come to know that any employee of the government or provided by the government or as for that matter any company Besides the salary what he gets and besides the perk what he gets, anything else he received from anyone outside, it is equal to bribery, it is equal to gulul, it is equal to embezzlement. That means any government servant in any country today, Muslim country or any other country, if he receives anything besides the salary and the perk which is mentioned in the contract, Anything above, it may be, you know, we call in India chai pani, in Pakistan chai pani, meaning water and tea. Some people say sweets. Some people say oiling of the palm or greasing of the palm. Some people say under the table. All these things, gifts, any gift, direct or indirect, besides the salary and the perks that has been given officially in the contract, anything above that is bribery. So as far as the first question is concerned, asked by the brother in Nigeria, if you are a police officer or working at any post of the government, besides your salary and the perks that is given by the government, anything else is counted as bribery. 
as for matter of fact, if a person is working on a high post or any post in a private company as a manager of the company, he's getting his salary, he's getting his perks, he's getting his allowance. Above that, if any of the clients give him any gift, a watch or anything else, this is counted as bribery according to the beloved Prophet Muhammad It is counted as gulul, embezzlement. Regarding the second question, a similar question that is asked by Anonymous India that if anyone accepts bribe for some years and he repents and makes toba, how can he refund or compensate as he has collected money from too many people by doing this fraud? And as you know that bribery is the 32nd major sin in the book of Al-Qabair by Imam al-Dhahabi. Amongst the major sins, Imam al-Dhahabi lists bribery as number 32. It's mentioned in the glorious Quran in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 188, that use not your wealth as bait for judges in order to eat other people's wealth. It's mentioned in Jamit Tirmidhi, hadith number 1337, that the beloved Prophet Muhammad said that anyone who gives bribe or anyone who takes bribe, Allah's messenger has cursed them. So bribing is a major sin. If someone now wants to repent and do toba, what can he do? For doing toba, there are five requirements. Number one, he should agree what he's doing is wrong. Number two, he should stop it immediately. Number three, he should repent and ask for forgiveness. Number four, he should not do it again. And number five, if possible, he should undo it. For example, if you have taken bribery from many people, if you can remember the amount or the name of the person, and if you can give back, that's the best. If you do not remember, if you have taken too much, then follow the first four things at least, that agree it is wrong, stop it, ask for forgiveness, don't do it again, and what you can do is you can give charity. What you think you have collected in all these years, give that in charity to the poor people, ask for forgiveness, inshallah, Allah will forgive you. We have on the Facebook, Munira Tabassum, Sabuna Oromu, Amina Siri, Muhammad Shahid Hassan, Zawadul Kabir, Muhammad Rizwan Khan, Abdullah Al Rizwi, Tanim Huda, Jamal Gul, Terikul Islam, Baba Jumandi Kamara, Sadman Shakib. Assalamu alaikum, wa alaikum salam. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward all of you. On the YouTube, we have the man, Abdul Jabbar, billionaire, Fahad, Naz, Ahmad, Saroj Kumar, Young Gaming, Bilal Barao, Bali P, Ujwal Banwal. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward all of you. I would like to thank especially the subscribers of the YouTube. MashaAllah, just a few days back, Alhamdulillah, my YouTube channel, Dr. Zakir channel, MashaAllah, has reached more than 2 million subscribers. I would like to thank all of you and I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that may He reward you and inshallah, may He grant to Jannah. Similarly, the Facebook followers, MashaAllah, has reached more than 22 and a half million. I would like to thank all the followers of the Facebook too. And I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that may he guide you to the straight path and inshallah reward you. There is a question from Faisal Ahmad from Lucknow. What can the child do for one's parents after they die so both the child and the parents benefit in the hereafter? Our beloved Prophet Muhammad said that after a person dies, when he goes, to the grave, everything is gone. Only thing that returns are the good deeds he has done, the knowledge that he has spread, and his pious children praying for him. So the three things that are sawabi jariya are the good deeds and the wealth that the person has spent, the knowledge that he has spread, 
and his pious children pray. Regarding the question that what can a child do for the parents so that both benefit. The best thing you can do is become a pious human being. And once he becomes the pious human being, he should pray for his parents. So if he is pious and if he prays for the parents, inshallah the prayer will be accepted. Then you pray for your parents for Janita Firdaus Alala. So you become pious, be a good Muslim, do all the farais, stay away from all the haram activities, do as much as mustahab, do dawah in your life. And if you're pious and pray for your parents, for their akhirah, for your akhirah, for Janat al-Firdaus al-Ala, so that you and your parents and the company of Prophet ﷺ, then inshallah that will be the best for you as well as the best for them. The next question we have on the WhatsApp is from Chaya, New Delhi, India. She says, earlier I was a Krishna devotee. I recently reverted to Islam and I want to learn more and more about Islam. MashaAllah, congratulations. Sir, tell me the sources that would help me in knowing the true Islam, not what the media expounds, rather what Islam actually is. Sir, I am a big fan of you, but sadly you ain't in India. I cannot meet you. Inshallah, in Malaysia, I will come someday to meet you. One more query, please sort out, sir. I, being a former non-Muslim, I want to learn about Islam, no doubt, but I want to learn about comparative religion as well, so that in future, if someone mocks me, that I am a traitor and I changed my religion, I would give that person references of what his religion says. But I never know which book is pure or which is adulterated. Tell me a place, library, e-commerce, site, etc. From where the religious books I buy would be very pure and knowledgeable according to you. Sister Chaya has asked a very important question. And mashallah, she accepted Islam and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept her deed. And inshallah, may Allah forgive all your past sins and may Allah put you in Janet of Fridos. Her main question is that what are the authentic sources of Islam? Where can she get knowledge? And particularly, she wants to know about comparative religion. The best book to read, sister, is the translation of the Quran. That is the best book. It is the most positive book in the world. It's a proclamation to humanity. And one of the best translations that I would recommend you to read is by Abdullah Yusuf Ali. It's available in the market. It's available online. And if you read this translation, it is the best. And this translation has a commentary. It has got footnotes. It has got tafsir. It's very good. If you want a simpler translation with the modern English, I would recommend Sai International. Sai International has been translated by three reverse ladies. Some of them have been married to Arabs. And that's a very good translation. If you want something more voluminous, you can refer to Tafsir ibn Kasir, the abridged summarized version by Darus Salaam. If you want to read books of Hadith, I would recommend that you read Umdatul Ahkam, Abu Lughal Maram, in which the Ahkamata mentioned. Read the Seerah of the Prophet, the life history of the Prophet. There's a book by the title Sealed Nectar, which is the translation of Varaikal Maktoum, Sealed Nectar, by Safiur Rahman Mubarak Puri. It's a very good book, Alhamdulillah. The translation is available in English from Darul Salaam. Regarding knowledge of comparative religion, I would recommend to you that you visit my website, zakinnaik.com, and this website has a lot of information on comparative religion. Besides information on Islam, it has information on Christianity, on Hinduism, on Judaism, and many other religions. There's a special section called as Islamic Dawah Training Program. And in that section, you'll have a lot of questions that are replied. The most common question asked by non-Muslims. Very important. Read this. Memorize it. It will help you to reply to the queries asked by non-Muslims. As you said that if someone mocks at you, how will you reply? And most of these reply besides giving references from the Quran, give references from the Bible, from the Vedas, from the Gita, from the religious scriptures, give references from scientific books, and give the answers with reason logic also. There are common questions asked by Hindus, 
It's there on this website, common questions asked by Christians, common questions asked by the atheists, etc. This website, zakirnaik.com, would be useful for you in replying to questions asked by non-Muslims, by atheists, and answering the questions on Islam with reason, logic, and science. And it has got hundreds of questions that have been answered. The separate section of question answers. If you want to specifically know reply to questions about Islam, I would recommend that you should refer to the website islamqa.info. Islamqa.info is a fantastic, authentic website which is mainly catering to replies of the questions asked regarding Islam. And this website is the most popular Islamic website in the world. According to the Alexa ranking, it is close to four and a half thousand, with 4,500 in ranking amongst all the websites in the world. Among the Islamic websites, it's number one. If you have any query regarding Islam, type your query on the Google, follow it up with Islam QA, and inshallah you'll get the reply. It is islamqa.info. There are other Islam QA also, but this Islam QA, which is the most authentic and the best in replying to questions on Islam, is islamqa.info. And I hope that answers the question. The next question from Arsalan Khurshid, Bihar, India. Is covering one's head during Salah a Sunnah or a culture? First, we'll discuss whether covering the head is Sunnah or a culture and then come to covering the head in Salah. There is a verse in the Quran, in Surah Araf, chapter number 7, verse number 31, which says that, O children of Adam, take your adornments for every time and place of prayer. Telling to the Bani Adam that, take your adornments, your beautiful apparels, at the time of prayer and the place of prayer. This is the only reference you get regarding the clothes of prayer in the Quran. As far as whether covering the head is a sunnah or a culture, there are different opinions. Some group of scholars, they say that covering the head is a sunnah. Some group of scholars say it's only cultural. But all the scholars unanimously agree that if it is in the culture that covering the head is respectful, then the Muslims should cover the head. But if it is not considered as respectful in the society, like Western society, it may not be that respectful covering the head. So then if you don't cover it, it's okay. But in India, Pakistan, in the eastern part of the world, in Malaysia, Indonesia, it is respectful to cover the head. So at that time, it is better than you cover the head. So the scholars are divided whether it is a sunnah or not. But according to Nasruddin Albani, Sheikh Nasruddin Albani, he says that it is sunnah to cover your head. And the Prophet and the Sahabas covered the head. Sheikh Ul Islam, Ibn Taymiyyah, he said the Sahabas always covered the head. The Prophet covered the head. So it is not from the Sahaba to uncover your head. So according to Sheikh Ul Islam, Ibn Taymiyyah, covering the head is a sunnah. Even according to Ibn Qayyum, he says that the Prophet wore the turban without the cap. He wore the cap without the turban. And you find several hadith which say that the Prophet wore a turban, the Prophet wore a black turban, the Prophet wore a kufi, the Prophet wore a cap, the Prophet wore a white cap. There are several hadith. So based on these hadith, this group of scholars say that covering the head is sunnah. It is from the salaf. From the salaf, it is that we should cover the head. So according to Sheikh Nasr Darbani, Ibn Taymiyyah, Ibn Qayyum, may Allah have mercy on them all, it is sunnah to cover that. As far as I'm concerned also, I believe that covering that is sunnah, irrespective whether you're in the eastern part of the world or whether you're in the western part of the world, since the Prophet covered the head, since the Salaf covered the head, I believe in those group of scholars that say that covering the head is sunnah. Regarding the question of covering the head during Salah, is it sunnah or is it a culture? As far as covering the head is concerned, there is no proof, no hadith, no Quranic verse that it is fun to cover the head during salah. So it is very clear cut 
that covering the head is not a fard while offering salah. It's not a requirement. But those scholars who believe that covering the head generally is a sunnah, they also say that covering the head is mustab during salah. Imagine if a person comes from the western part of the world and he wants to be an imam in India or Pakistan and he uncovers his head. It would be very weird because this part of the world covering that is not only a culture, they consider it a sunnah. That's the reason even if the Muslims, when they don't cover the head in the normal times in India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, at least while salah, they cover the head. But recently in the last few years, five or ten years, you find many of the Muslims coming from Gulf countries and they want to show the people that they have knowledge and because it's not fard to cover head in salah, now you find people reading salah in the mosque without covering that. Previously, maybe 15-20 years back, 99% of the people in the mosque, always the heads were covered. With cap, or with gathra, compulsory. Now you find at least 15-20% or maybe a little bit more, because they have gone to Gulf country, they come back and they want to show the people that they have knowledge, so purposely they don't cover that while offering salah, which is not a good practice. If covering people consider covering the sunnah, even if you don't belong to that group, at least it's in the culture. So at least by offering salah, cover that. Why are you going out of the way and praying salah without covering your head? Let me tell you, it's not far to cover your head. The Prophet said only an aura should be covered, and if you have two pieces of cloth, one piece of cloth should be over your shoulders, and the other piece of cloth should cover your aura. This is the minimum requirement, but natural. According to many scholars, covering that is sunnah, and even according to the Hanafi school of thought, covering is a sunnah, and according to many fuqahs. So I believe that covering that is sunnah, and when offering salah, so it should be covered, and even when offering salah, it is preferable that the head should be covered. This is in reference to the gents I'm talking about. But naturally, for the woman, covering the head is farad in front of the namada and offering salah also but natural for the woman, covering the head is the fact. The next question from Maareen from Kashmir, India. Can women read the Quran during menses? There's a different opinion whether women can read the Quran during menses. Unanimously, all the fuqahas, all the scholars agree that the woman during menses cannot touch the musaf of the Quran cannot touch the copy of the Quran. This is unanimously agreed upon. All the scholars also unanimously agree that women during the menstrual period, they can recite dua, and if that dua contains a few words of the Quran or a small section of the Quran like Bismillah or Eidallah, it is permissible. There is no difference of opinion in this. The difference of opinion is in that can the woman recite the Quran during menstruation? Most of the fuqahat, most of the scholars, they say that women cannot read the Quran during menstruation. And the reason is based on menstruation is like janapa, like major ceremonial impurity. Major ceremonial impurity means after a sexual intercourse or after nightfall or where there's emission after the sexual intercourse, it's called as janaba. So these scholars say that menstruation is like janaba. And they quote a hadith of Ibn Abbas, may Allah be pleased with him, that the Prophet said that during menstruation, the woman, and during janaba, both men and women, they should not recite the Quran. Now, this hadith, according to most of the Muhaddithin, it is a daif hadith. So, this hadith in which the Prophet said that the woman during menstruation and during janaba, male and female both, they should not recite the Quran in the Daif Hadith. So you cannot base your fatwa on this. So based on this, according to the Maliki school of thought, the women are permitted to recite the Quran during the menstruation. Especially if they are doing hymns of the Quran, if they are students. And imagine the menstruation can last for four days, five days, seven days, two weeks, for longer period. And imagine you are away from the Quran. Even one view of Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal is that a woman can read during menstruation the glorious Quran. And Sheikh ibn Taymiyyah, he believes in this view of Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal 
that a woman during menstruation can recite the Quran. And even Sheikh Shaukani, he agrees that a woman can recite the Quran during menstruation. But natural, here the woman can only recite what they know from memory because they cannot touch the Quran. But now, Alhamdulillah, if they have to touch, they can touch with gloves or they can have some wood or a box in between, etc. But Alhamdulillah, lately, since the last several years, we have got Quran on a digital platform. And all of them agree that if you read the Quran from a mobile or from an iPad or on the computer, a woman in menstruation can read from a mobile the Quran, can touch the mobile, can touch the iPad, can touch the tablet, can touch the computer. This ruling that women touching the Musab is not applicable here because it's the digital format. So even though all the scholars agree that women cannot touch the Quran during menstruation, but according to Imam Malik and one view of Imam Abdul Nambal and Imam Ibn Taymiyyah and Shaukani and some others, their view is that women can read the Quran during menstruation, but she should not touch it. But naturally, if she has a mobile or a tablet, there's no problem. From that, she can read, she can recite. And I also agree with this view of Imam Malik and Imam Ibn Taymiyyah as well as Imam Shokani, that women during menstruation can read the Quran, but they should not touch the Quran. And best now is to read from the mobile or from an app application or a tablet. And inshallah, so that during these few days, whether it be four days, five days, 10 days, 15 days, they can be in touch with the Quran. And but naturally, they can also read the translation of the Quran. They can read the other aspect, the fasir, etc. Hope that answers the question. The next question is from Sayyid Owais from Gujarat, India. I am 23 years old, Alhamdulillah, and currently I am handling my father's business. In today's fast-paced world, corruption and wrongdoing have become necessities to run a successful business. As a Muslim, how can I practice my faith as well as handle my business without compromising in my deen? It's a very important question asked by Brother Sayyid Owais and he says that today you cannot run a successful business without doing malpractice, without corruption, without lying. I do agree with you partly but not completely. I do agree that there are many businesses if you do malpractice, if you do corruption, if you tell lies, you'll make a better profit but I don't agree with it completely. There are occasions, mashallah, that if you're honest, if you're truthful, you will have a better clientage. In the long run, it will benefit you in business. It will give you more profit. But I do agree with you that by corruption, by cheating, many people make a lot of profit. But for a Muslim, Allah says in the Quran in Surah Mulk, chapter number 67, verse number 2, Allah khalaqal mawta wal hayata. Allah has created death and life to test which of you is good indeed. This life that we are leading is a test for the hereafter. And Allah is testing you. How do you lead your life? And Allah says in the Quran that if you seek this dunya, Allah will give you this dunya, but will not give you akhirah. But if you seek for the akhirah, Allah will give you akhirah and the dunya. So, as a Muslim, you should not involve in any activity which is haram. You cannot do corruption, you cannot tell lies, you cannot fabricate. I'm aware that in many businesses, if you lie, you get a better profit. If you cheat, you get a better profit. If you fabricate. But as I told you, this is not the case always. In the long run, if you're honest, you benefit more. If you're honest, the clients keep on trusting you better. Irrespective whether it benefits you in this world or not. As a Muslim, if you follow the teachings of the Quran, being honest, do not cheat in the weights, do not cheat in the measurement, do not lie, be truthful. If you do this, inshallah, you will benefit in the akhirah. And Allah will even give you benefit in this world. And that's the reason we find that many of, mashallah, the Muslims who are very strict to Quran and Sunnah, they may not be very well qualified in the business acumen, but because they follow Quran and Sunnah, you find that the business flourishes a lot. And 
irrespective whether you benefit here or not. So if you're handling your father's business, and if you really care for your father, first thing you have to do is think about the akhirah. It will benefit you and your father and your akhirah. And after benefiting akhirah, inshallah, it will even benefit you. And I always say, and I give these examples to the Muslims, that if you are doing a business, then make Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala your partner in business. What you should do, you should say that whatever profit I make, I will spend part of this profit in charity. You start with small. Why don't you start with, okay, 10% of my profit I will give in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Maybe if you make a profit every month of suppose $10,000, once you start giving 10%, you give $1,000 every month in charity, inshallah your profit will increase to 20000 Then what do you do? Okay, increase your charity to 15%. So when you were getting 10000 you had only 10000 with you, the moment you start giving $1,000, 10% profit, your profit increased to 20,000. From the 20,000, you're giving 10%, 2,000, yet 18,000 is with you. Now, instead of 10,000, you have 18,000 with you. Now, moment is it's 20,000, you start giving 15% profit. Now, from 20,000, you are giving 3,000 dollar in charity in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yet 17,000 is with you. Allah will increase the profit, would make you $30,000. The moment Allah keeps on increasing, or whether Allah increases or not, you keep on increasing the share of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the share in charity. And inshallah, the balance remaining with you will be a bigger amount than the previous balance. The more percentage of profit you give in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, your percentage reduces, but your total amount increases. And I can be a witness. The best example is myself. Alhamdulillah. In my earlier stages of dawah, my parents and my brother supported me completely, 100%. I didn't have to think about my living. But the moment I started doing my own business, I had to just spend maybe a couple of days in a month, a few hours a week, because I'm a full-time guy. I dedicated my life full-time for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the barqa that Allah gave me in business, initially I started giving 25% of my profit in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then I started giving 51%. And I kept on increasing. The moment I kept on increasing my profit, the percentage of profit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I will not tell you till what limit I went. MashaAllah, I started earning millions of dollars in a year and sometimes million dollars even in a month. Alhamdulillah. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed me. So the bigger percentage you give to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, your percentage becomes small, but the money remaining from it is MashaAllah. So I request you, that when you're handling your father's business, see to do not break any rule of the Quran or the Sunnah. Be very honest. Inshallah, Allah will give you barqa in the year after as well as in dunya. Next question. From Brother Khurshid Akbar from Karnataka, India. Allah says in the Quran that if all of you from the first to the last come and worship me, it will not increase in my greatness. If this is the matter, then why does he order us to worship him? What the brother is asking, that if all of you come and worship me, it will not increase my greatness. It's not a verse of the Quran. There are similar verses, I'll come to it later on. What the brother is referring to is a hadith, a Sahih hadith, in Sahih Muslim, word number six, hadith number 6572 where our beloved Prophet said that Allah says O oh my slaves if the first of you and the last of you if all the men and if all the jinns if they were equal to the most pious person whose heart is the most pious heart in the full world if their piety is equal to that piety of the most pious man on the face of the earth, it will not increase in my dominion. That means it will make no benefit for me. And Allah continues. O my slaves, the first of you and the last of you, the men and the jinn, if all of you are equal 
to the most evil person, the evilest person in the whole of humanity. If all the men and jinn are equal to the most evil person, it will not reduce even a bit from my dominion. O oh my slaves, if the first of you and the last of you, if the jinns and the human beings, if all of you gather together on a strip and if they ask me whatever you want and if I give everything for whatever you want, it will not reduce in my dominion. The loss would not be greater than when a needle is dipped in an ocean. I am recording and will repeat all this to you so that if you realize, you will praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you don't, then you will be to blame. From here we come to know that irrespective whether you are very pious or you worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it will not increase in Allah's greatness or in dominion. If you are very bad, if you are evil, it will not mean any loss to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you ask anything what you want and Allah gives you everything, yet it will not reduce in the dominion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is like if you dip a needle in the ocean, even that much will not be the loss in Allah's dominion. There's a verse in the Quran, in Surah An Kabut, chapter number 29, verse number 6, which says that if you strive for your work, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not require any of the wants of any of his creations. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not have the need of any of his creation. Allah repeats a similar message in Surah Fatir, chapter number 35, verse number 15, that it is you who are in need of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah is not in need of anyone and is free of all wants. So these verses of the Quran say Allah doesn't require anything from his creation. Come into the question, then why is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asking us to worship him? Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Dhariyat, chapter number 51, verse number 56, tul jinna wal insa illa That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created the jinn and the men not but to worship him. What is the reason? The reason Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants you to worship him is not so that he will benefit. It is because you will benefit. And how will you benefit if you worship him? See, when we worship, the best form of worship is salah. In our salah, the most important thing that you have to recite, without which the salah is not complete, it is Surah Fatiha. Surah Fatiha consists of seven verses. It is the first chapter of the Lord's Quran. It is called as Ummul Quran, the mother of the Quran. It is called the major Quran. If you read Surah Fatiha, the first three verses, it says, Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. Praise be to Allah, the Lord of the world. Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim, the merciful, the gracious. Maliki Yawmuddin, the master of the day of judgment. The first three verses of the Quran are praising Allah. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. Praise be to Allah, the Lord of the worlds. The most merciful, the most gracious. The master of the day of judgment. Here, why are we praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? The reason we praise because it is human psychology. The moment you start praising someone, you start following him. For example, if your mother is sick and if someone on the street, a person comes and tells you, do this treatment so that your mother who has got a heart attack, she will be cured. And there's another person who you know is the most famous heart specialist in the world. He comes and tells you regarding the treatment for your mother who had a heart attack. Who will you follow? Will you follow the unknown person on the street or will you follow the advice of the heart specialist, the famous heart specialist in the world? But naturally, you will follow the advice of the heart specialist because he's famous. The moment you know that he is the person who is the best heart specialist, follow the advice. Similarly here when you say Allahu Akbar Allah is the greatest. Allah is the most wise. Allah is Hakim. He is the most merciful. We are praising Allah not because it will benefit him because the moment you start praising him then Surah Fatiha continues. It says Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim Malik Yawmuddin Iyaka na'budu wa iyaka na'stain. Dear Lord we worship Dear Lord 
We ask for help. After the first three verses of praising, we are telling that we only worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We only ask him and no one else. Is the Nasrat al Mustaqim. Show us the straight path. The path of those who have earned that fame. The path of those that have earned thy favor and not the path of those that have gone astray. Here we realize that the first three verses of the Fatiha, the first chapter of the Quran, is praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then we are saying, we only ask Him for help and no one else. And then we say, show us the straight path. And then the path of those that have earned thy favor and not the path we have gone astray. So, this in Surah Fatiha, the most important part of the Salah. Then the full Quran is the guidance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What you should do and what you should not do. You have your zakat, you should do hajj, you should fast, you should not cheat, you should not murder, all these things are there. So alhamdulillah, the reason Allah is asking us to worship Him is because the reason Allah is asking us to praise Him, if we say Allah Akbar a thousand times, it will not make Allah greater at all. He's already the greatest. Even if you abuse Allah knows billah, it will not make Allah low. Allah is always the greatest, He will remain. The reason we praise Him is because then we praise Him, we follow His advice. And the full Quran is the advice to the human being, how you should lead your life. So the reason Allah asked us to worship Him is not because we benefit Him, it will benefit the human beings. We praise Him so that we realize we have to follow one who is the greatest, who is the most wise, who is the most knowledgeable. So it will benefit us, it will keep us healthy, it will inshallah take us to Jannah al firdaus So the reason we worship Him, we praise Him, is not for His benefit, He doesn't require it, it is for our benefit. Hope that answers the question. The next question from Hamad Uttar Pradesh, India. I was asked by a non Muslim that if music is considered haram in Islam, as it takes a person away from the remembrance of Allah, then even sex, the reception intercourse, should have been haram in Islam, applying the same reasoning because it also takes one away from the remembrance of Allah. Please apply. This is a very good question from Muhammad that if music is haram because it takes a person away from Islam, then even sex, sexual intercourse should be haram because it takes a person away from the remembrance of Allah. Let me tell you, music is haram because the Prophet has said it's haram musical instrument, one of the additional reasons is that it takes a person away from the remembrance of Allah. Regarding sexual intercourse, depending on whom you are doing sexual intercourse with, then whether sexual intercourse is haram or not will apply. If you are doing sexual intercourse outside the marital bonds, if you are not doing it with your wife, but natural, and now since slavery is abolished, doing sexual intercourse outside the marital relationship, it is haram. So surely sexual intercourse is haram because when you are doing it with people who are not your wife or not between the spouses, it is surely haram. It will take you away from remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But if you are doing sexual intercourse with your wife, with your legal spouse, then you will follow the guidance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran and the Hadith. Our beloved Prophet Muhammad said that when you are doing intercourse, you do wudu. Now when you are doing wudu, wudu is ibadah. You are coming closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In wudu, you say bismillah, in the name of Allah. Then you read, Ashad la ilaha illallah wa ashad wanna Muhammad abdul rasul. You say that, I bear witness that there is no God but Allah. And Prophet Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. Then, you are remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. While you are doing intercourse with your wife, you are praying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that whatever you give, Keep it away from the shaitan. So when you are doing intercourse with your wife, it is taking you towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In fact, doing intercourse with your wife is also charity, our Prophet said. If you do intercourse with your wife and don't do it with someone who is outside the marital bond, even that is ibadah. Because they are following the commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So doing intercourse with your wife is ibadah, it is charity. They are following the commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But if you are doing sexual intercourse, away from your marital relationship with someone who is not your spouse, it is haram and surely it will take you away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Hope that answers the question. I am running short of time and that would be the last question I have answered. And let me tell you inshallah that those questions which have not been answered, I will pick up one question and inshallah I will give a call 
to one of the questioners whose question has not been answered on the WhatsApp video call, inshallah. So don't be surprised if you hear from me. And inshallah, till we meet next Saturday, same time for this program, ask Dr. Zakir and his son Farik. Till then, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh wa akhirul da'wan alhamdulillah.